And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right. So this week we've got Gary Hamill on the podcast with us. So Gary is an author of multiple books, uh, What Matters Now, Future of Management, uh, Leading the Revolution, and newly just coming out, uh, Humanocracy, which we're going to dive into, releasing in August, I believe, right, Gary? That's right. Awesome. And um, and you're also a professor at London Business School, right? Uh, since some- 1983. Okay. And you do consulting on the side as well, I believe, right? Uh, a lot. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And um, so just jumping into it, I I don't know. This is just got diving right into it. So um, when I first saw, found your work, it was actually a few years ago. One of my friends, uh, Chad Beyer, um, he's another Agile coach, uh, PST. And um, he was super excited about your book, uh, Future of Management. And he read it and he was just like, couldn't say enough great things about it. So I read it right away. And we both just couldn't believe like it's been a decade since that book was published and nothing has changed. And um, I love the quote that I've heard you say multiple times and I, it's, in, it's in your books um, that says, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to make much progress, but life is too short to work on inconsequential work. And I've actually stolen that. I've had a couple uh, talks that I've given and given you credit, of course. Um, but I guess, do you think we'll make any progress on reducing bureaucracy in the workplace and, and making him uh, work more humane? You know, I, I hope we will. I think we will. Uh, you're right. I wrote that book more than a decade ago. And really, that that was more an argument that we needed to, to think about management as a place we could innovate. You know, organizations over the last few decades have spent an enormous amount of time kind of re-engineering their operating models, logistics, supply chain, and so on. More recently, they spent a lot of time digitizing their business models, uh, most like behind the curve. But I argued in the future management that we have to think of the management model as also a place where we innovate. And if you go back over the last 100 years, you find that the companies that have built enduring advantages really did so by reinventing the way they manage, lead, organize in ways that unleashed human capacity. But I have to say in that book, I didn't say a lot about the how, right? It was just more saying like, we need to start taking this seriously. And I think, you know, a lot has changed then. and, and, And one of the good things I think is that when I talk to CEOs around the world, they increasingly will, will recognize that what's really holding their organizations back is not the operating model, it's not the business model, even those, those things have to change and evolve, but they really understand it's the management model. They have too many layers, they're too slow, too conservative, too insular. They don't really know how to change it, which is why I wrote the new book, but they all understand like that old model just doesn't work. And I think there are a lot of leaders who, are, who have been learning a new definition of hopelessness which is trying to create in a networked hyperkinetic world with a you know rule driven authoritarian uh, uh, organization just like you, you can't do it and mm-hmm. i think they're at that point so i'm i'm pretty optimistic that 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 we are going to start to see a fundamental change in how how we manage uh, partly because as I, as i said organizations are now up against a set of problems that lie outside that old uh, management model Number two, they have a lot of people coming to work, the first generation in history, who really didn't grow up with inside hierarchical organizations. They grew up on the web, and that shaped their expectations about who gets who gets heard and how you accumulate power and influence and so on. And I think thirdly, we just have new tools, right? We can now bring people together across organizations for, mm-hmm. for, for you know, for all of human history. Power was really about vertical lines of authority, right? In, in, a, in a traditional organization, everything was vertical. Now we're all connected together horizontally. And so those tools are making it possible to bring people together, solve problems, hack those old models where you really don't have to wait for somebody at the top to say, it's okay. Right. Uh, So, you know, I I see all these organizations and they're aligned like something like a pyramid. And if they're doing that, they're generally aligned towards efficiency, towards maximizing management of people. They're not optimized for value delivery, for purpose, for cost, being country, customer centric. Um, I mean, when you were talking about innovating on management models, are you, if anything's a pyramid, are you saying like, we should probably be thinking about changing that? Well, I, I, I think so. You know, if the, 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 the bureaucratic structures we have today are really a mashup of, of two things. They're a mashup of military command structures that go all the way back to the beginning of human history, as far back as we can go. And more recently, of, of the disciplines of industrial engineering, which go back basically to Frederick Taylor. And so the, the, the command structures provide the architecture of management, and it is a pyramidal architecture. The problem with that, of course, is in that pyramidal architecture, you are giving a small number of people at the top 
the right to hold the organization's capacity to change hostage to their own personal willingness to adapt and change. So, you know, the, the, the simplest reason why, why companies miss the future is a few people at the top fail to write off their depreciating intellectual capital, and yet they're still in charge of what is strategy, where are we going, who gets the yeah. resources, and so they, they, you know, they undermine the resilience of the organization. The, the, the second part of it, you know, that the, the, the industrial engineering part, that provides the ideology of management, not the architecture, but the ideology. And if, if you look up the word manage uh, and you're looking for a synonym in just about any language, the first synonym is the word control. So the ideology of management is controlism. And you go back and you read Frederick Taylor, the you know, principles of scientific management. The argument was you needed this new kind of category of super employees called managers essentially to do the controlling, to make sure that people adhere to product standards, uh, customer requirements, budgets, and so on. And, and control is important. We'll come back, I'm sure, and talk about that. But the way we got control, which is turning employees into semi-programmable robots, that just doesn't work anymore. And the costs are, are, are too high. So yeah, we, we have an organizational model that, that was based on that architecture and that ideology. And I would argue, until we change those things, whatever else we do is going to only produce incremental gains. Yeah. Yeah, there were, yeah. Uh, sorry, if you don't mind, just uh, there were a number of things that were running through my head as I was reading the book. So a um, couple of things to call out here, in, along with the zingers that you threw in there, which you've already kind of hit on one of them. But uh, so, so Larman's laws, like the first one, organizations are implicitly optimized to avoid changing the status quo, right? Like I heard that again and again coming, coming out in the book, like why would anybody be incentivized to change the structure? Um, but then you've got along with one of your, your zingers in here, in a bureaucracy, the bigger the decision, the smaller the number of people who can challenge the decision. That's dumb. Yeah, it is really freaking dumb. <laughs> like, why would we think that the bigger, the more risky the thing is, the less people we should have thinking about that decision, the less uh, diversity of thought, the diversity of ideas, the diversity of experience. Let's eliminate all of that and just give two or three people the ability to make these instrumental decisions for our organizations and moving forward. Like just saying it out loud like that doesn't sound like a very smart idea, but yet that that's the commonplace that we have in so many of the different organizations. Um, the last thing I wanted to, to quickly comment on, I, I think you're, you're familiar with Stephen Denning, but the, the law of the small team, the law of customer delight and the law of the nexus. Again, those, those, I, I liked how he simplified those ideas in, in, in his book, The Age of Agile, and you just kind of blew them all out. And I love the amount of data that you brought to the conversation. It was like every page you had a footnote in there <laughs> about here's a report that's that's quantifying all the negative stuff that we're seeing because of this bureaucracy. Because it's so easy for everybody to sit down and say, I hate the bureaucracy. But it's another thing to actually say, here's some reports about actually the consequences of this type of action that's out there. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, again, you're right. You know, we can all whine about it, but, but until you start to calculate the cost, nothing changes, right? Bureaucrats pay attention to things that can be measured. And uh, so when we figured out how to measure quality through statistical process control, we started to be serious about it. When we started to measure uh, environmental impact, people started to be serious about it. And most of the costs of bureaucracy, apart from, you know, maybe the staff groups get bloated too many layers, but most of the real costs, the insularity, the conservatism, the lack of engagement, those are things that never show up on a P&L. And so one of the things we're arguing in the book is you have to start to measure the cost of bureaucrosis and, and we need stakeholders, investors, and others who are holding leaders accountable for driving those costs down because they are real costs. You know, we have, we have institutions that are wasting society's resources, that are not getting the best out of people, who are not globally competitive. And, and it's not like these costs are just like notional. They are real costs that exert a cost on productivity growth. And, but nothing's going to change until we, until we start actually measuring them, comparing, and holding, holding ourselves accountable. Yeah. So, so when we're thinking this, um, I don't want to say gripe is necessarily the right word, but you know the, the final few chapters of the books really focused on what you were talking about earlier, the how. How do we actually break out of this type of vicious cycle? And the, the problem, and I know Jeff has run into this, I've run into the past, is it requires a certain amount of buy-in and authority in an organization. In other words, it's not the frontline workers who are often going to get the buy-in to make these changes. It's at least a middle-level manager who has some sort of accountability inside of the organization to start that change. And then 
or even best case, somebody at the top and leading this, uh, et cetera. But the, the point that I'm getting at is that's okay for people that are in the position today. What I'm curious about is um, being a professor working at a college, how is that changing how we're actually training people who are interested in getting into this management type role that it's less about command and control and more about decentralizing command, more about bringing autonomy and accountability down to the teams and reinforcing innovation. How is that starting from just a, a, a college level or an institutional level before they actually enter the workforce? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and there's there's a bunch of stuff packed in this. Let me let me do a riff and then you tell me whether I'm going in the right direction or not. I mean, certainly, you know, ideas around servant leadership and leading from behind, those have been around for a long time. And and I think some of that probably does get taught in, in business schools and other places. But the reality is then those people go inside of organizations where those are not the 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 the, the behaviors that get rewarded. Right. If, if you think about it, bureaucracy is a massive multiplayer game. People compete for the prize of positional authority and the salaries and perks that you know come with it as, as you climb the greasy pole of, of, of bureaucracy. And, and to win at that game, you, you, you have to cultivate certain behaviors. Like, like a level 10 player is going to know how to hoard resources, how to negotiate targets, how to, how to manage up, uh, how to deflect blame, how to uh, you know grab credit. And so if you know, wh wherever you are in your heart, whatever kind of leader you want to be, like these are the these are the behaviors that get, get rewarded. So, you know, in, in a way, bureaucracy makes assholes of us all. And we find ourselves behaving at ways in work where we're elbowing rivals, you know, out of position or we're making decisions that really we don't take account of, of the human consequences. Or we find ourselves like, um, 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 you know, manipulating data so it, so it fits the prejudices of our boss. So, so, so it has that corrosive effect on us as, as human beings, but it also then distorts the decisions. And you know, one of, one of the most disturbing things in our, in our research, this is a big survey we did with the Harvard Business Review, 76% of employees say the primary way you get ahead in our organization is becoming a better bureaucratic infighter. Now, I, I don't know whether that's literally true because in most organizations, I think competence still matters, but if people believe it's true, then that's, that's what you have to learn, learn, learn how to do. So, you know, I think, you know, the, the education, the training that we do will only take you so far until the environment itself changes. And that's why, you know, to be, to be like super frank about it, I think most executive education is kind of almost a waste of money because we, we get these people all excited about being different kinds of leaders and so on. And then they go back into that old context and you're kind of lonely there and that's not the way the system works. You say like, well, okay, what, what you know, what can I do? Having said that, you know, most of the training is still not really about creating 21st century leaders. You know, most of the leadership development you find in organizations is highly stratified, right? It's about first, you know, learning to lead yourself, lead a team, lead a business, lead the whole organization. But the whole assumption is that 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 being a leader is mostly about where you sit in the pecking order. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I hear people in organizations, they'll use the phrase the leadership team. And I got to like, well, what the hell do you mean by that? Um, you know, first of all, I can tell you, if, if you mean the top 20 executives, most of them are not leaders, at least by my definition. And, and I can tell you for sure they are not a team. If, if you mean like a selfless group of people working together to accomplish some common goal. And yet, you know, we've, we've completely, completely conflated the idea of leadership with the idea of where you sit in, in the hierarchy. And one day, you know, the consulting industry, academia, we all woke up and we said, okay, we're not going to call people managers anymore because that's kind of boring. We're just going to start calling them leaders. But that didn't change anything in, in, in the system around those people, and nor did it change much in their behaviors. And we know that because a ton of research says man, you know, leadership development, the way we're doing it now, doesn't make much of a difference. And that it, I'm chuckling because you're like riffing on all the things that I highlighted. So I got my cheat sheet over here, and you're, you're literally riffing on the things that I highlighted. Um, but that your, your last comment there um, leads me right back to Larman's Laws with culture follows structure. Right. Until we start dismantling and thinking about restructuring this way, well, our culture is going to reinforce this this rigid hierarchy, this rigid pecking order that we've gotten in place and kind of leading to the question of how how do we how do we break out of all of this stuff? So. Um, sorry, let me pause, Jeff. You go. Ahead. Yeah, I want to kind of dive dive into that. So a lot of times when I go into organizations, I say the highest priority thing for us to figure out first is structure. Well, like what's a structure that's going to give people autonomy? 
free flow of information allow us to deliver value to our customers. And that behaviors, behaviors will be next, and that practices or um, practices, because if we started practices, which a lot of consultants come in and do, they can have no soul and they can just like leave people void of what they're doing. And it sounds great on paper, like, hey, I helped, I did a hackathon and we did this great thing at our organization and everybody came up with all these ideas. But like, if you don't implement it or it's not, it's a, a fake empowerment or fake autonomy that you give your teams, it's going to be kind of empty. And so if we can get that structure in place where we're aligned around what's valuable, um, how we deliver that value, I think that's the first thing. And then we can coach on behaviors and, and practices later. What are your thoughts on on, on that approach? Yeah, you know, I, I don't I, I might start even uh, uh, deeper uh, uh, and, le- and let me let me just like sketch out a simple little model, which is maybe a little hard to do just, you know, in, in the mind here rather than like pen and paper or whiteboard. But let me just sketch it out. So if you think about it, at the top is your worldview. What do you think is important? How do you look at human beings? What's the purpose of a business? And, um, you know, the, 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 the worldview that is baked in, in, into bureaucracy is, is a view that human beings are resources. So the institution hires people to produce products, profits, and whatever. As long as that is your view, you are stuck. What, whatever else you do is not going to make a lot of difference. So, you know, my argument in, in humanocracy is we got we to gotta turn that around. Individuals join institutions to have an impact in the world and make a living. And it's the institution that's the instrument, not the human being. Mm-hmm. So, so first, you, you, you kind of get, get, get the worldview right, the paradigm right. That paradigm will tell you what problems are important to solve. So in the bureaucratic model, the problem to solve was efficiency at scale, which is a very good problem to solve, right? We like, thank goodness, somebody spent the last 150 years solving that. It just doesn't happen to be a high value added problem anymore. But it will tell you, you know, your, your worldview tells you what problems to solve. You know, the first time I met uh, Zhang Rumin, the, 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 the CEO and chairman of Hire, extraordinarily progressive appliance maker based in Qingdao, China, he said, our goal is to turn every employee into a CEO. Hmm. Now, how do you how do you get how like what leader would ever come and say, that's the problem we're trying to solve? You only get to that problem if you have a higher level point of view. And Zhang's point of view, which he you know went on to say, he said, I want to view human beings as as ends and not as means, right? So that's that's kind of the categorical imperative. So the, your worldview tells you what problem is important. The problem then points you to certain principles. So in the, in the bureaucratic model, where we're trying to the problem is maximizing efficiency, you end up with principles of standardization, specialization, hierarchy, um, stratification, and 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 once you've embedded those principles in in structure, systems, processes, and so on everything else follows from there. And so one of the things that that was very curious to me, right? I, I have enough gray hair that I've, like, I've seen these movies play more than once. So I'm just about old enough to remember back in the 70s when we had things like, like T groups, and then we had high performance work teams, and we had Volvo and others working on self-management. And then we had total quality management with Deming's principles about uh, 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 you know, empowering workers, and then you know it goes on, and now we have agile and and mindfulness and 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 whatever comes next. So I watched this thing play out again and again, and pretty much nothing happens, right? That that, that these things they have a life of about three to five years. Organizations adopt them in hopes of like something major happening. Within about three to five years, they're all recolonized by bureaucracy, and we're using mm-hmm. now the new words, but we're behaving in the old ways. Because we didn't start with new principles, and so so what 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 we spent a lot of time on in the book is saying so what are the new principles? So if you start with that view of human beings and you say the problem is not to maximize conformance but maximize contribution, then what principles do you need? What do we know about human flourishing and how you do that? Well, we 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 know you need people who feel like owners. We 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 need ownership. We need true meritocracy where you get ahead by value added, not by political games, and so on. And then once you have those principles, you start to say, okay, how do we operationalize those in processes? How will those processes affect everyday practices? The way you do a performance review, the way you manage a project team, whatever it may be. And then finally, how do those practices drive performance? And what I've seen is so often, and you guys, I bet you've seen it in your careers as well. You know, normally when we go out to benchmark organizations or when companies talk to consultants, what they really want to talk about is processes and practices. And so we import those new things and we try to graft them onto the old principles, the old bureaucratic rootstock, and we wonder why it doesn't change. Because what you're not getting there is DNA level change. It's like, 
It's like putting a tutu on a dog and hoping you're going to make it a ballerina. And you go like, you just end up with a stupid looking dog, right? Yeah. And so I think going back to first principles is pretty is pretty critical here. And if you because if if, if you look at the companies that really seem to have escaped that that the curse of bureaucracy, um, none of them started with a view of, of of how you build a team or 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 even like where power lies. They they did not start with with thoughts about structure or process. What they started with was a deep set of principles. How do you maximize human human freedom at work? You know how do, how do you turn everybody into an entrepreneur? I think of the guys who built W.L. Gore, an extraordinary successful post-bureaucratic company. People would know them from Gore-Tex. And, and, and Bill Gore said, I want a company where everybody always feels like they're working in a skunk works. And so if, if everyone starts with those principles and you stay true to them, you know, sooner or later, by, by, for sure, you will discover something like Agile. You'll get to Agile. But more importantly, you'll, you, you won't give it up. You'll keep going. You'll elaborate it. It'll get even more radical over time. And 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 without those those principles and without that 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 you know fundamental uh, um, a worldview, uh, inevitably the 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 familiar the gravitational pull of bureaucracy will just you know suck you back into the old shapes and the old behaviors. Yeah, I I see that happen all the time. Where you know agile started with values and principles, like that's all it is. If you look at the agile manifesto when it started in two thousand one, right? Like it is values and principles, and that's the way they left it. And then there's all these. I mean, consultants were in that field, but the consultants that come in and say, here's these practices and without living the values. And then you get into decision making every single day and the values and principles aren't aren't lived and they're not even talked about. So I think you're right. You have to have those and you have to live them every day and have feedback loops where you can say, hey, are we following this or are we not? And make conscious trade-offs. So what I think that a lot of organizations don't realize is that every time they say yes to something, they're saying no to something else. And what do you really want to optimize for? And I think that they optimize for stuff, like you were saying before, economies of scales much more than they probably need to. And where now it's more about how do we get economies of scale towards learning? Like, how can we learn faster? That's the most important thing, I think, especially in the knowledge economy. Like, that's those are the companies that will be successful. The quicker you can learn, the quicker you accelerate that feedback loop, the further you'll get and the more you'll be able to accelerate right into the future. People well, learning, I, I organization, organization products learning. You have to ask around Agile. You know, I, I just see a lot of executives, you know, they go from they go from kind of uh, the, the program du jour and it's like, hey, let me go get me. Let me go get myself some of that agile stuff. Yeah. Right? Yep, like yep. everybody's talking about that stuff. I was like, OK, that, like that's great. It's, not, it's 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 fundamentally the right thing to do. But the thing I would ask a CEO is different questions. I would say, first, how much of your authority are you willing to give up? Right. Right. Number two, I want to know how many of the layers in your organization are you willing to take out? I mean, forever mm -hmm. take out. Um, you know, when, when Hire made the jump to their kind of uh, post-bureaucratic model, they, they, they redeployed 12,000 middle managers. They went from eight layers to two. Don't, don't talk to me about Agile if you're not willing to do that. Don't right. talk to me about Agile unless you are willing to open up the whole strategy conversation to the entire organization and you are willing to give up your monopoly on creating strategy and direction at the top, right? Because, right. because if so, you know, people will see the inherent contradiction between the values of Agile and, 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 and the values by which you are still leading and running the company, which are the values of positional power and the value of, of exclusivity and so on. And, and, you know, and, you know, pretty soon the gap between the rhetoric and the reality will become, uh, uh, you know, just, just a breeding ground for cynicism. And um, so, yeah, you, you, you got to start with the right questions and, and this deep inward uh, uh, view and know whether this is really for you or 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 not. And and I see the problem so often when when companies go out to benchmark other organizations uh, and happens all the time. They they go into these organizations and their question is what are they doing? That's the wrong question. The question is what mm -hmm. are they thinking? Right? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Because the doing part of it is not so hard to figure out once you have the right underlying beliefs. But if you don't get that right. You know, then then again, um, uh, you know, you're stuck in, in incrementalism and you can only increment on the model you have. And sooner or later, it will it will suborn, it will marginalize, it will pollute, it will corrupt whatever new thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. So earlier, Jeff, you were you were talking about that pace of change. And this was another thing that had come up with just like, how long does it take change to go through your bureaucracy? The, the eight levels that you were just talking about earlier, Gary. 
Um, but it reminded me of this quote, and I wrote it down specifically for this. It comes from, uh, I think it's Friedman's book, uh, Thank You for Being Late. And he talks about the supernova and the pace of change and all these innovations that are going on. Um, and he was talking specifically about Moore's law and how quickly uh, exponential change happens and how that affected the microchip. And so um, it, we, we, it's hard to think about how much that, that chip, just the microchip has learned or has improved with exponential change over the years. And so he created this, it's not an analogy, but um, so he said, had the 1971 VW Beetle improved at the same rate of, uh, of change as the microchips did under Moore's law, that 1971 VW Beetle would get 300,000 miles, would travel 300,000 miles per hour, would go 2 million miles per gallon, and would cost you four cents. Like that is a phenomenal rate of change, but yet our structures haven't changed barely at all, right? We're still stuck in this old, old way of thinking when the world is just so rapidly changing around us. And you talked again about that idea of decentralizing. How are we empowering our frontline workers to be uh, thinking about it with that entrepreneurial mindset? How would I take hold of this business, this small uh, organization, the Oregon and org, right? The Nexus organization. How do I have buy-in and uh, payout in that responsibility, right? How do I get um, a, 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 sli a slice of the pie, if you will, to make it worth my while? Because I think a lot of uh, a lot of leaders think about, well, we want to we want to pass and delegate down that responsibility down to our employees. But where's the incentive for them to take on that additional accountability? If we're not changing some of those incentive structures that go along with that, well, then why, why on earth would I want more accountability? Where's my, where's my buy-in to this? Now, great, uh, uh, and you hit on this, like autonomy is one of the, uh, I can't remember exactly what the, the statistic was in there, but empowerment is empowering. Like it makes your life a little bit better, right? Um, but you should have some buy-in to uh, the, the benefits of that, the return on investment for taking on that accountability now that our leaders are looking to shift down to you. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well... First of all, I'm not sure how many leaders really are working hard to expand the autonomy of frontline employees. What, what I can tell you is, let's, let's look at the data. What we know today is only one in five employees believes their opinions matter at work. Only one in, 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 in 19 have any say over their who gets hired, their peers, who comes and works next to them. Only one in 10 believe they have the freedom to experiment at work and try new things. Uh, uh, the, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates that 70% of all jobs in the U.S. economy require little or no originality. Uh, and then when you kind of look country by country, I just saw some data for the U.K. where it says task discretion over the last 20 years has been going down in the U.K., hmm. not up. And so, we, you know, I, I, I talked about this in a book or two ago, I can't remember, but, you know, you have this fundamental paradox where digital technology has, has liberated us in extraordinary ways. You, you think of our lives as consumers today, how much power we have, how much influence we have. Uh, you think of what, what you see on YouTube as, as we've democratized the tools of creativity so anyone can do a podcast or, or, or put up a video. It's just like extraordinary change. And then you look at our lives at work. You know, I, I know, I know companies that are still debating like, this idea of bring your own device, right? Can employees use their own smartphones or computers and whatever? And like, that's like, that's like the high water mark of empowerment. And I go into this organization <laughs> and say, like, okay, I, I like the idea of bring your own device, but what about pick your own colleagues? What about choose your own boss? What about approve your own expenses? And their heads explode. And mm -hmm. so you, you, you have this, this, this absurdity where as individuals, we, we, we go out, we buy a car. Most people have a car. Many people will buy a dwelling. And yet at work, you can't buy a $300 office chair without somebody's permission. And in fact, the way I would bet, despite, like, let's take the rhetoric aside, because rhetoric, like, talk is cheap. But if you look at the reality, if, if you have multiple levels of, of managers, well-paid, who see their primary job as control, and, and that's, like, that's what you're there to do, that's, that's, you know, that's the product they make. And now you have all this new digital technology that allows you to track everybody's like behavior and value at moment by moment, how many keystrokes, how, you know, how quickly do they dispose of the phone call? How many, you know, whatever do they process? How do you think that's going to turn out? And there are a lot of people, you know, who are warning us of the new kind of digital tailorism and where, you know, and, and, and actually the evidence seems to be pointing that, that way at the moment. So, um, you know, so first I think you got to be honest, like, and, and you, and you got to go down and ask your people, 
Do you feel like you have substantially more decision-making autonomy today than you did a year ago or three years ago and five years ago? And when we do that research, the answer is no. It is not yet moving that way, at least not in any kind of broad-based uh, uh, way. But to your point, it isn't, you're right, it isn't just about empowerment. Uh, in fact, let, let me say this. I think it's dangerous to empower people if you don't equip them, mm -hmm. right? If, if you have frontline people that have never been taught to think like business people, so if you look at Southwest Airlines or 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 or, or you look at uh, some of the other companies we profile, Nucor in the steel industry, these are companies that teach every frontline employee business economics. They teach them how to think. They can tell you, you know, what what are the load factors? What's the capital efficiency? What's the ROI? So first of all, if you want to give people a power, you they need to have the skills to exercise that that wisely. Number one, but also as you say, they need to have a financial stake. Right, it's a single-digit percentage in the United States of frontline employees who have any real financial upside, and so you know, yeah. If you say I'm going to give you more autonomy uh, without without any upside, that's just you know, that's more pressure on me. It's more of a burden, and 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 why? And mm -hmm. so you know, the, the the companies that I think are figuring this out, what they're saying is we want to create a confederation of owners, of people who have the two things that owners have. One is they have real decision rights, so there's a local PL and they can make decisions that influence. That's true at Svenska Handelsbank and Europe's most profitable bank. It's true at higher in, in China. It's true at Nucor. And number two, they have to have a financial upside. That's, that's what it means to be a business owner. That's what it means to be an entrepreneur. And some of these companies are showing, they're proving that you can build that entrepreneurial spirit inside of a very large organization and you can have both the benefits of entrepreneurship and you can have the benefits of scale uh, you know, side by side, but it does require that people have real freedom to make meaningful decisions, and you have a sense of equity that I'm going to get get you know the value, some of the value that comes back from that. In my experience, though, I see that if you give the upside, but it's the number of people that are contributed to that upside that that P and L is too big, then people feel like my one out of 3,000 people in this company doesn't really matter. Yeah, we get upside if, as a company we do well, but if I slack off and do nothing or if I work really hard, it really doesn't matter that much. Yeah, so I think yeah, you do have to make it smaller too. The commons, you know, and, and so, you know, companies will say, well, you know, we're great because every employee has some shares. Okay, great. Yeah. Every employee owns 0.00000002% of the company, right? Or as you say, I'm working inside of a unit that's so big that my marginal contribution is literally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what Hire has done, and again, this is just, this is familiar across all these organizations. Hire broke down an 80,000 person organization into 4,000 microenterprises. These are not project teams. These are not just like development units. These are entire business units. They contract with other services. They have a real P&L. They can measure their, their, and so, so, you know, you know that in that thing, your contribution matters enormously. Your voice will be heard uh, whereas otherwise, you know, not so much. And, you, you know, if, if I if I think that I'm more or less irrelevant to, to the ultimate results, I'm going to check out. Right. And I think this is related. It, it was just one line in the book that really just struck home to me. And it was uh, directly related to what we we're just talking about. But uh, functions like HR, R&D, manufacturing, finance, IT and legal uh are in essence internal monopolies, okay? And what's the result of a, of a monopoly? Mediocrity, inflexibility, and inefficiency. I, I had never looked at them like that, but when you phrased it in that way, it was like, holy shit, these are internal monopolies. And everybody knows that monopolies are bad ideas, but we just don't kind of think about them in that way. I mean, all the time in, in the days of being a consultant, going into an organization, well, first of all, why are you engaging with a consultant? Oh, because we can't get change to happen internally. Uh, we've got to go external for the change. Um, but then even when we used to do, Jeff and I used to work at a company developing products for an organization. Well, why are you coming to us instead of your own IT department? Oh, well, because they're too slow, they're inefficient. Um, it takes forever to, to get back to us. What we get is low quality. Well. That's a monopoly. Well, welcome to, to, to the world, right? Um, but it was just such an eye-opening way that you that you phrase it to say, yes, this again, just like your your earlier singer, this is stupid. This is dumb. Why would you do it this way? Uh, but it's just kind of reinforced by the structures that we have in place that are out there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Thomas, Thomas Spain, who is this amazing political theorist 200 years ago, more who was kind of behind the the the, the uh, uh, American Revolution, the French Revolution? He said a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. 
And, and the problem is these are just habits, right? We've, we've grown up inside and around these organizations that, that like these absurdities just like, like we accept it. In the same way, if you think about it as consumers, right? You know, I, I, I'll give you, a, go off on a riff for a moment. I remember like more than, more than a decade, 15 years ago, uh, being in a boardroom with one of the most powerful media companies in the world. And they were, they were quite diversified. And the question was like, like, what should be the unifying logic for what we do as, as a media company? And I said, well, probably the unifying logic is you put the customer in control of the media experience. And of course, I couldn't see Netflix at the time. I couldn't see a lot of other stuff. But it was clear that this technology was going to empower the users, and that there was this, uh, you know, there was this this uh, uh, irreversible shift in in power between the producers and the consumers. And I remember that day, you know, in this boardroom, the CEO said, "Gary, we can't do that. Our whole business model is based on these release windows and controlling which platforms you can look at it on, and 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 so on." He said, "We just can't do it." I said, "Like, okay, good luck." But you know the the, the 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 future is pretty much indifferent to your preferences. Just to be clear here, and I think you know it's it's just the same. You we we bake in these absurdities and we get used to them and we forget how toxic they are until somebody comes along and says, you know what, I, I'm not going to play by those rules. I'm going to do something different. So so at higher, you know, if I'm if I'm let's say I'm one of those little micro enterprises, maybe I'm 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 uh, selling three door refrigerators. I'm designing and selling. So I will buy HR, my HR help from an internal micro enterprise and I write a contract with them. I will buy design help that way and, and distribution. And what's interesting is in every one of those internal contracts, there's a clause, a performance clause in there where what you pay everybody else, the HR help, the design help, that, that depends on the success of the product in the marketplace. And if it doesn't succeed, everybody takes a hit. So here's, here's, the, here's the crazy thing. In most organizations, it is a small minority of employees whose compensation is at risk depending on, on, on customer satisfaction and market outcomes. You know, it's, it's a small, tiny percentage of people who actually feel like owners. You know, right now we're having this big debate about the future of capitalism and whether capitalism is broken. And I'd, I'd love to come back to that and go a little deeper. But I will say this. I don't think the problem is with capitalism. I think the problem is we don't have enough capitalists. Right. Mm -hmm. I think everybody in organization should be thinking that way, should have the upside, should 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 be vulnerable. If, if you're not creating value like, you know, and, and, and at higher, those little micro enterprises go out of business. Right. And I think that's, you know, that's, you know, probably how it should be. Right. I, I was going to jump in real quick because Jeff and I often talk about this and he, he might be reading my mind right now. But we, we often articulate our time as a consultant or uh, as consultants at this company we used to work for um, the way we structured our contracts were a, a rolling 30 day window. So we were, we were working with scrum teams. We would go and present to the organization, you know, at the sprint review talking about here's the latest increment of value that we're looking to deliver. And we never, we, we didn't do fixed time budget scope contracts with customers. It was always a rolling 30 day window. We, we didn't have salary transparency, but we had transparency to what we build of the customer. OK, so every one of our team members knew every two weeks we were writing out a, a bill to this customer for twenty thousand dollars. And if they didn't like what they were seeing from us, 30 days notice and they're done with us. All of a sudden, the blinders to I'm Jeff Molesky and I only test or I'm Jeff Boobles and I only code. All of a sudden, all those blinders started to fall away. And it was like, what do I have to do to contribute to delivering value to a customer in the next two weeks? Because if we don't, we can get fired. And that well, is, to me, was a game changer. More, Jeff, is you find that all those internal kind of uh, fiefdoms and, and, and role uh, specializations, it all disappears. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're all accountable and, and you're in it together. You know, at, at, at higher, if, if a unit gets into trouble and you can see this product is not going to ship on time or has some other problems, you know, everybody who has a contract with that micro enterprise, they're all going to come together and swarm the problem because, like, we're all at stake here. It's not like going this, it's not my problem, that's marketing. No, no, no. We're all going to take a hit. Let's come together and solve this thing. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, when you strip this away, in many ways, it's rather simple. And in many ways, it's, it's, it's kind of rather logical. But it just kind of demonstrates the power of the old model. And more particularly, the, the, the self-interest, if I can say so, if I can be blunt, of, of the people who've done well by that model and, and don't have a big incentive uh, uh, to change it. You know, it's, it's hard. You know, I don't, I don't want to get into like a big conversation on CO pay. But I do wonder sometimes, you know, 
when you have 300 or 400 to one differential between CEO and frontline pay, and particularly, I'm not talking about a Jeff Bezos who builds something from scratch. I'm talking about people who got ahead by being bureaucrats and administrators and are all there, and you have these salary differentials. Like, how do you credibly say to, to people like every idea matters or you're critical to the future of our company? Because they're just going to look at you like, like, no, I'm not. Like, this doesn't like even add up. Uh, and it's very hard in that environment to really say, yeah, we need to like radically flatten the pyramid. We need to have different way of thinking about gain sharing. We need to build a confederation of owners because like, you know, when, when, when Hire made that jump, they redeployed 12,000 middle managers. Their jobs just disappeared. Now, many of them went to work in these little entrepreneurial uh, uh, units and many of them have done better than they were before. But there were no more. There's just like, you know, that wasn't there anymore. And I think. Just one last thought on that. So, you know, it's important to remember that bureaucracy is just a technology. Mm -hmm. And basically, it, it was, if, if, and, and like all technologies, it's a technology of its time, right? Just like, you know, the combustion engine made sense at a time, maybe less sense now. Bureaucracy made sense in a world where most employees were very poorly educated, and so they needed to be told what to do. It made sense where information was very difficult and expensive to move. So you had 10 people report up, then you'd aggregate and report up. And so literally the CEO was the only person with the whole picture. Well, we don't live in that world anymore. It made sense when, 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 the, when, when the competitive advantage was primarily around scale. So that means doing massive things exactly the same way again and again. Well, that's a little bit less true now. And it made sense in a world where change was kind of gradual and it was really just about replication rather than innovation. So, so we have this technology that reflects the world 150 years ago, and yet it's still the dominant you know, way we organize organizations and, and, or, or put our companies together. And the, 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 the one thing I, I say to CEOs, you know, we, we, we've all seen enough radical business model innovation that we get that. And I mean, I, I wrote about that years ago when I wrote a piece called Strategy is Revolution. So like you've got to, you know, you got to think about this in, in, in radical ways. Um, but then I ask people, like, can you imagine if you take your organizational model today, can you imagine something that is as different from the status quo as Netflix is from three channels of terrestrial television? Because if you can't, you're going to lose. Because, mm -hmm. because why why wouldn't we see as much innovation here as we would in our in our in our business models? So you know, and I, I think slowly people are waking up to that. Hopefully, the book gives people a lot of tools of like, okay, I get it, but I'm not like, what what do I do? But you first of all have to see this as a technology we just inherited, something that is increasingly a liability, and we have to be able to imagine something that is as radically different as uh, you know, a smartphone is from a black brick, you know, plugged into the wall. Yeah, 100% agree. And I think one of the ones that always gets me is like policies and procedures that people put in place. I think the the biggest thing that I would just say is go to transparency. You, you, you hit on that in your book all the time. And, and uh, we've been a part of companies where it's had the, you know, transparent travel policy, and all the stuff gets posted on the wall, and everybody gets to hold each other accountable for that. And it's actually really interesting when you first do that, because like so all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're arguing about a three dollar coffee here. We spent more money arguing about a three dollar coffee. Like, should we get a coffee or not? Like, that's a minor thing. Don't worry about that stuff anymore. Like, we should be like, hey, you stayed at a five hundred dollar hotel when there was a two hundred dollar one right down the road. Like, why why do that? You know, you know, multiple nights, things like that. So um, I think there was a learning curve there, and we had to learn the business, and we had to learn what mattered and what was like just small and just let it go. But it's worth it at the end because then you are all owners and you all take personal responsibility for, you know, income and expenses and what's coming back to the larger group. So, yeah, I can't say enough about transparency solves a lot. And so that's one and of the I big think, ones that I, I would think, go to. Uh, a lot of the need for heavyweight control disappears when you have transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about my my role as a, as a university professor and. You know, I, I learned really early on the first term I was I was uh, at the London Business School. At the end of the term, I had 100 students who all gave me a rating. They could comment. This is, you know, before it was online. But every every bit of that was available to everybody else in the library. Like there was no place to hide. Like I don't need the dean telling me what to do. I don't need like a lot of protocols on how to be a good. Like I am going to figure this thing out pretty damn fast because mm -hmm. like that's the way it works. And so. Yeah, we we way underestimated, I think, the value and the power of of, of control. But you know, it it's um 
but it's still so tempting, you know, to believe that you can you can control this all from the top. I a, a couple of things just strike me. One, I had a conversation a few years ago with a CEO of one of the biggest, most notable tech companies in the world, and he said, "Gary, I can now run the company from my from my corporate jet because I have all this real time data." And I said, "Yeah, you have data, but did you know data is all backward looking?" Data is 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 the pattern of the of now. It is never going to show you what could be. It is only going to show you what is, and mm -hmm. it comes completely without any context, right? You don't know what was really happening on the ground in that place. But but there's this conceit that with enough data, and, and, and the other conversation I remember was with um, Jim Schnabe. He was the co CEO at SAP. He's now the uh, uh, a non exec chairman of Maersk and Siemens. And he said when he left SAP, they had fifty thousand KPIs. So, you know, and, and it's kind of the opposite of having just a few simple measures, local units, P&Ls. So, so the, the conceit there is we can, with our brilliant engineering minds, we can disaggregate this complex business into thousands and thousands of subsidiary gold. We can tell everybody if you just do that, it will aggregate back up into brilliant performance, except that never does because the world's too complex. You couldn't predict everything that was going on the ground between when you wrote those KPIs and now like the whole world has changed. So, so, and yet I think that, that conceit, I think Frederick Hayek, what did he call it? The conceit of information. I don't remember, but we got to get over that, right? You, you, yep. you know, if, if you're a leader today, you are no longer the decision maker in chief. You are no longer the chief strategist. What you are at best is a social architect who's thinking through mm -hmm. how do I build the systems, the values, the capabilities? How do I strengthen those things in a way that unleashes human capability? But um, but that's a very hard uh, conceit uh, to give up, uh, you know, uh, particularly when you think that that is the basis for your your vaunted compensation is that somehow I'm smarter. I mean, literally, this was this was less a, a year or two ago in Harvard Business Review. A CEO, I won't mention, no reason to embarrass, but from a Fortune 100 company, venerable company, and the guy said there are certain opportunities that only the CEO can see and certain decisions they can only make. And I'm going, that's horseshit. Like, that's that's simply that's simply not true. The CEO is usually the last to know. right? I, I watched Microsoft for 20 years. The, the second half of Gates' time there and, and mostly under Balmer, they missed every single significant opportunity for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so, so Nadella, Nadella shows up and he says, well, the one big mistake we made was that we thought that Windows was the end all and be all for forever. Like, mm -hmm. no kidding, Sherlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but why did that happen? And, and you go back and you go inside the history of Microsoft and you'll see for every new thing, for, for tablets, for, for graphical user interface, for whatever they missed, there was a brilliant team working on that, usually ahead of the curve. At the point you have to come get funding and get real, 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 real resourcing for this, somebody's sitting at the top and saying that doesn't fit with our window strategy, right? Or that that doesn't like that doesn't fit with my my mental map of the world. No, we are not going to do that. So yeah, um, but 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 to get that kind of humility at the top and say I don't know, and and we're going to have to experiment our way in and learn our way in, and I can't tell you what's next. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of people really struggle with that, not knowing what's next. But I would say, like, for CEOs that are out there, we just had uh, Rich Sheridan on. I don't know if you Rich, know Rich. He's the CEO of Menlo Innovations. And uh, he was talking about COVID uh, when it hit. Like, him and um, um, his other founder, was it, sorry, it's Jerry, I think. Um, they were, they just sat together and they said, okay, look, like, things are happening. We need to get out of here because we work in a very... COVID friendly way where we're like really close to each other, pairing on everything, touching the same devices. Like we have to leave and we have to, and we have to go and separate. And we also, we need to protect the business. And so how we're going to do that is everybody, we're going to cut our pay to zero and we're going to move everybody down to our bottom rung of pay. Cause we know that if we let people go, there is going to be this survivor syndrome that's going to happen. And everyone's going to feel like oh, I shouldn't have let this person go. Cause they are really a family at that organization. Um, and I think that's a, a viable thing for a CEO to say, yep, we're going to make this hard decision right now. We need to make it fast. But like you said, strategy, that should be everybody's responsibility. Sales, that should be everybody's responsibility, right? Like as many decisions as you possibly can make together, then you don't have to do any change management. Then you don't have to get people on board. You have alignment because they're all were a part of it. Um, so I guess that's my balance there. I guess I think there are certain situations where, yeah, a CEO might need to make a call really fast and quick for the sake of time. But um, there are going to be other times where 
you know, the ninety percent rule is going to be like, let's do it together. Yeah, and I what are think your on that? even those few times, um, I mean, the, the 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 fact that the CEO needs to make that decision, let's say around compensation, is is merely a fact that 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 there's an organization where nobody else had any ability to make those decisions. So that's that's just like, yeah, well, if you're the only one who can make it. Maybe the problem is that you were the you you had too much authority on that particular issue to begin with, because you know the way I probably would have handled that, you know, um, I would have said, okay, guys, let's have a very quick conversation about what it's going to take to survive this. And somebody's going to quickly say, we are going to have to all move our salaries down a big notch if we want to keep our best people. So you know, yeah, they do have I, salary I, transparency uh, there though too. Okay, so like they. Really CEO to do that because I'm guessing that if you put the question to people, you pretty quickly, almost immediately, have a consensus that this is what we need to do. Yeah, they did have they do have salary transparency there, and they do pair, and everybody manages the PNL on like a two week rotational basis, so everybody has, knows what's going on. Um, and they do have salary transparency and full PNL transparency. Yeah, so they're, like, they're, very, they're a very cool company. I know them, and yeah, I think yeah. they certainly be one of one of my benchmarks uh, uh, as well. But I think what you've seen in, in COVID is really interesting because, you know, in a small crisis, power goes to the center. Okay, we're we're going to sort this out. Everybody, like you know, just just wait. And we'll tell you what to do. But in a big crisis, it goes to the periphery because pe- people give up on the center. And so if you look at what happened and, you know, I, we don't need to go in, into the detail and, 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 and do the forensics on this, but clearly the CDC screwed up hugely at the beginning by saying, no, no, we're the ones that, that will figure this thing out. The FDA screwed up hugely as one of the, the healthcare leaders in Italy said, the virus moves faster than our bureaucracy, like no kidding. And, and so what happened is if, if you actually look what happened, it is, it is healthcare providers, it's, 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 it's mayors, it's, it's, you know, people around that said, okay, we got to get together and sort this thing out. Let's share data. Let's figure out what's really going on and try to, you know, try to do the best we can. And I think, you know, talking to a lot of leaders in the wake of this, you know, the, the one thing they say back to me is we were surprised at how quickly our people reacted. We were surprised that like, you know, they, they, they did the, the, the right thing more often than not. And I think, you know, it was one of those times when people dusted off their initiative and said, okay, like, like we can't wait for somebody else to figure this thing out uh, uh, for us. Uh, and, and I think, you know, there are more and more issues in our world that are like that, right? The, the world is just moving too fast. It's too chaotic for, for any small group of people at the top to tell you what to do. It's, it's why, you know, Jeff Bezos said, I wanted to build the world's biggest laboratory. Right. He said, I don't know. I don't know where the what's going to happen in the future. We're going to experiment more often with more things, more cheaply than anybody else. And we'll find the stuff that works. That's Mm -hmm. a very different view than saying, you know, I have this like um, incredible vision. And let me tell you where we're going. And, uh, you know, if if you look at if you look at the history of so many Silicon Valley companies, you you had a very visionary founder. The company Mm -hmm. runs to the end of their headlights. They've never developed the capacity for a more collective way of thinking about the future experimentation. So you get to the end of the founder's headlights and like then 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 you hit a wall. So um yeah, it's it's uh creating strategy in an open way, I think is just just you know fundamental today. Agreed. That's awesome. Well, Gary, it's been an amazing conversation, fast and furious. Um Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, we hope everybody listens to or goes and gets Humor on uh, your new book as it comes out here in August. Um, and we'd love to have you on in the future. Again, this was, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun for me. I We, we were just scratching the surface here. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> awesome. Good.